Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the awesome privilege of coming into your presence on your holy Sabbath. Father, we know that this privilege is going to come to an end sooner rather than later. But we thank you that we can still meet freely to open your word and to study it. We ask that as we study this morning the story of Jacob and Esau, that your Holy Spirit will help us learn the lessons which will help us in our personal walk with Jesus. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. During the course of this seminar, we have been studying stories in Genesis which have a prophetic dimension. And our theme verse in this series has been Genesis 3 and verse 15. That famous text that speaks about the warfare between the serpent and the woman and between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. Now, you've probably noticed that the book of Genesis has a series of two sums. You have the serpent and the woman. You have the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. You have Cain and Abel, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Isaac and Ishmael. Jacob and Esau. Joseph and his brothers. Basically, the book of Genesis is an amplification of Genesis 3 and verse 15. The story of Esau and Jacob is actually a microcosm that illustrates the issues in the great controversy between good and evil on planet Earth. I would like us to notice how this controversy is introduced in Genesis 25 and verses 22 and 23. You see this story is more than about Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau are typological, they're symbolic, they represent two worldwide groups at the end of time. Their characters illustrate the characters of two classes of people that will exist till the end of time. And we catch this from the very beginning of the story, from the moment of their birth. Notice Genesis 25 and verses 22 and 23. But the children struggled together within her. Was there a great controversy from the womb? Absolutely. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now we find very clearly from the very beginning that the strong will lose and the weak will win in this battle or this controversy. We'll notice a little bit later on in the story that Jacob acquired the birthright, whereas Esau, to whom it originally belonged, lost it. Jesus, by the way, expressed this same principle when he said, the first shall be last, and the last first. In other words, in this battle between good and evil, between righteousness and unrighteousness, those who appear to be strong will be the losers, and those who appear to be weak will be the winners. <coughs> now I want you to notice the difference of the characters of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 25 and verse 27. We're told there in Genesis 25 and verse 27, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter a man of the field. In other words, he was hardened by his experiences. And our second textbook, Patriarchs and Prophets, says that he, he loved to go and hunt, and when he came back he would tell his father about all of his encounters with wild animals and all of his wild experiences while he was out in the field. 
He was kind of a, of a raging type of individual. But notice Jacob. It says, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. One mild-mannered man and another a wild, raging individual. Two different characters. In the book Story of Redemption, page 97, we find these very significant words. Jacob and Esau represent two classes. Jacob the righteous and Esau the wicked. Now the whole controversy in the story of Jacob and Esau is found in the issue of the birthright. Now more properly this can be called the primogeniture. It's a word that we don't use much in English. In Spanish the word is used. It's the word primogenitura. The individual who was born first had certain duties and certain responsibilities and certain privileges. I might say. Basically the primogeniture or the firstborn had three privileges. Number one, he was going to be the ruler of his father's household when his father should die. Secondly, he was going to be the priest. He was going to be the spiritual leader of the family. And in the third place, he would have the privilege of being the progenitor of the Messiah. Three huge privileges. Govern his house according to the will of God. Lead his household spiritually. And have the privilege of eventually bringing the Messiah into the world from his lineage or from his line. Now let's read about one day that Esau came in from the field and was just starving, at least in his concept. Let's go to Genesis chapter 25 and verses 29 to 34. It says here, now Jacob cooked a stew. Evidently he was a good cook, according to scripture. You would expect so because he was a, he was a homeboy, if you please. In other words, he was docile. He enjoyed being with his mother. And of course he learned the culinary skills from his mom. And so now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. By the way, the name Edom means red. In a moment we're going to find out that everything related to Esau is red. And there's a very specific purpose for that. And now Jacob sees his moment of opportunity. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Now if Esau had been in tune with the Lord, what would he have said? No way, I would rather starve than not have the privilege of leading my family in the fear of the Lord, being the spiritual leader, being the ruler, and having the privilege of, from my line, bringing the Messiah into the world. I can't sell my spiritual privileges. But notice the type of person that Esau was. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. Of course, that was hyperbole, that was an exaggeration. I am about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose, and now notice, he went his way. He didn't give it a second thought. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You see, the problem with Esau is that he looked at the privileges of the birthright. But he did not understand the responsibilities involved. In other words, Esau wanted the power without the necessary character. Now, Ellen White, 
In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 178, by the way, this is the second textbook that we've used in this seminar, the first is the Bible, says this about the character of Esau. But Esau had no love for devotion, no inclination to a religious life. The requirements, now notice this, the requirements that accompanied the spiritual birthright were an unwelcome and even hateful restraint to him. In other words, being the, the, the leader of the household, being the spiritual leader, bringing the Messiah into the world, he had no interest in that. He wanted the power, the rulership, yes, but not the responsibilities and the duties. She continues saying, the law of God, which was the condition of the divine covenant with Abraham, was regarded by Esau as a yoke of bondage. How did he look at the law? As a what? As a yoke of bondage. Belt, uh, bent on self-indulgence. He desired nothing so much as liberty to do as he pleased. To him, power and riches, feasting and reveling were happiness. He gloried in the unrestrained freedom of his wild, roving life. He believed the law of God was a yoke of bondage. He wanted to eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow, he said, I will die. And that's it. Now we can catch a glimpse of how Esau was like when he decided whom he was going to marry. You see, his father said, when you marry, marry women, not from Canaan, but from our own parentage. And I want you to notice what Esau did in his father's face. Notice Genesis chapter 28 and verses 6 through 9. He was defiant and disobedient to his father, as well as to God's prescription that he needed to marry someone from the household of faith. He became unequally yoked, and to more than one, I might say. It says in verse 6, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there, because she was from the household of faith. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. And now notice what Esau does. Also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife, in addition to the wives he had. And if you go to chapter 36, you'll find that he married four women from Canaan. In his father's face. In other words, he was defiantly disobedient to the will of God and to the will of his father. He did not want any restraint. He lived for this present life with no regard whatsoever for the future life. Now I mentioned that the color red is very closely linked with Esau. The reason why is because Esau lived by the sword. He was a violent man. I want you to notice the following examples from Scripture. We're not going to read them, but we're going to just mention them. Genesis 25 and verse 25 says that when Esau was born, he was born red all over. Evidently he was hairy and his hair was red. And that's the reason why his parents called him Edom. He was called Esau, of course. But another name of his was Edom. And do you know what Edom means? Edom means red. Not only that, we just read in Genesis 25 and verse 30 that Esau sold his birthright for some red lentils. Furthermore, we find that the name Basra, another name for Edom, means ripe grapes significant. And if you go to Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 5, you'll find that both Edom and Basra are mentioned in the context 
of the sufferings of Christ and trampling the winepress and blood splattering all over his clothes. In other words, the color red emphasizes bloodshed. And this is the type of person that Esau was. And eventually he would come against his brother to try and destroy him. Now as we look at the Bible, at other places where the Edomites appear, we discover several characteristics of what Esau's descendants were like. I'm only going to share these with you in passing. All of these characteristics show an, an impulsive, violent people. For example, they were proud and arrogant, according to Jeremiah 49 and verse 6. They were cruel, Obadiah verse 3. They were vengeful. They liked to get revenge. Isaiah 26 and verse 12. They were idolatrous. 2 Chronicles 25 verses 10 and 14. They were superstitious. In other words, they were involved in spiritualism. Jeremiah 27 verses 3 and 9. They were wheeler dealers. They were very much involved in commerce. According to Ezekiel 27 and verse 20. And one of the worst characteristics is that they were traitors to their brothers. In other words, to the Israelites. According to Ezekiel 35 verses 5 and verses 10 through 15. And so we begin to catch a glimpse of what this first son represents. He represents people who live for the present time without any regard for the future. Who could care less about their birthright of being kings and priests and having their lives linked with the Messiah. People who live for the present moment, who only live for pleasure with no regard to what's going to take place in the future. And of course we all know the story. Jacob's mom, Rachel, said we cannot allow Esau to have the blessing. And so she prepared this plot where Jacob deceived his father. I'm not going to go over that story. Because Rachel said if we allow Esau to have the birthright it's going to be a disaster. By the way Esau had already sold his birthright. So Jacob wasn't really taking anything from him that Esau had not already sold. But the conniving methods that he used were wrong. And Jacob committed this terrible sin of lying, of hiding his identity. And of course, God would have worked it out in his own way if Jacob and his mother had just been patient. By the way, this shows that the end does not justify the means. You've heard the expression, all's well that ends well? No way. Not if you use the wrong methods. You see, situation ethics is off base. The idea that you can do something that's wrong as long as what comes from it is right. I call it Robin Hood ethics. Because it's okay to steal from the rich as long as you give it to the poor. No way. God would have worked it out according to his own calendar. But Jacob and his mother jumped the gun. And Jacob committed this terrible sin that caused separation between him and his father, between him and his household, between him and his brother. Now when Esau came back from hunting and, and brought the venison to his father, and his father told him, that he had already blessed Jacob, we find Esau crying out with bitter tears. In fact, let's notice that. In Genesis chapter 27 and verse 34, Genesis chapter 27 and verse 34, it says, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And said to his father, bless me also, O my father. Notice also, chapter 27 and verse 38. And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? 
Bless me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Was he repentant? Was he sorry? He was sorry of the consequences of his decision. But he was not sorry that he had made the wrong decision. He was, he was sad about the results of sin, but not the sin itself. You know, my Sabbath school class today, I was mentioning the case of Judah and, Judas and Peter. You know, they, they're very similar in some ways. Both of them betrayed Christ. Didn't they? Both of them betrayed Christ. Both of them repented according to Scripture. The word repentance is used for both. Where was the difference between the repentance of Peter and the repentance of Judas? Judas repented of the fact that his plan backfired. He repented that things didn't work out the way he wanted. By the way, he wanted Jesus to retaliate and to escape and to sit on the throne. In other words, he wanted to push Jesus into proclaiming himself king. When it didn't work out, the Bible says that he threw the money down and he went and he hung himself. That's the type of repentance of Esau. In fact, we find a reference to this in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 14 through 17. Let's read those verses. Hebrews 12 and verses 14 through 17. It says here, pursue peace with all people. By the way, Esau was just the opposite. He was at war with his brother. He was at war with everyone. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now notice. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. How is he described? A fornicator and a what? A profane person who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. He had crossed the line of no return. Concerning this, we find in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 181, the following words about the repentance of Esau. His grief did not spring from conviction of sin. He did not desire to be reconciled to God. He sorrowed because of the results of his sin but not for the sin itself. In other words, he was sorry that he made the wrong choice because of the results, not because the choice in itself was wrong. This is a counterfeit repentance. Now it's interesting to notice that this vile, profane person, fornicator, violent, idolatrous, arrogant, living for this present moment, for the here and now, rather than for the sweet by and by, when he saw that Jacob had taken his birthright, he said, I am going to get even, and I am going to kill my own brother. By the way, do you notice that this is a battle between brothers? It's not an outsider versus an insider. Both are brothers. Do we find this constantly in Genesis? We most certainly do. Cain and Abel were brothers. Joseph and his brothers. Isaac and Ishmael were brothers. And in every case the older brother wants to do what? The older brother wants to destroy the younger brother. Now I want you to notice here Genesis 27 verse 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I will what? 
Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And so from the very beginning, he pronounces the death sentence against his brother Jacob. Now, as a result of his sin, Jacob had to flee from his home. Let's notice that in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 43. This is by recommendation of his mother. He now has to leave his happy home because of his sin. He has to go to a faraway land. And as he's traveling, uh, undoubtedly he's shedding tears because he's lost his home because of his sin. Notice Genesis 27, 43. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. And now I want you to notice something which is of critical importance in this story. As Jacob is traveling to the household of Laban, God now gives Jacob a dream. Because at this point, Jacob is feeling like God has forsaken him because of his sin. That God cannot forgive what he's done. And he's fleeing from home. He's agonizing. He's saying, has God forsaken me? But when he lays down to sleep, puts his head on some stones, and God gives him a dream. I want you to notice Genesis 28 and verses 12 and following. It says, Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there were angels of God that were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, God is saying, see, you're not separated because of your sin. At this point, Jacob was repentant. He had cried out to, to the Lord for forgiveness. He says, I am the Lord, God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Does God promise to give him the land back? To bring him back to the land? Absolutely. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you see the same promises that God gave to Abraham? He's saying, first of all, the land, you will have the land back. Secondly, you will have an innumerable posterity that will live in the land. In the third place, all of your descendants will be blessed. And then there's a fourth promise. Notice verse 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Did God give Jacob definite promises? Yes, he did. He said, You've sinned, yes, but you are not forsaken. I promise that someday you will have the land, an innumerable prosperity, the blessing, and I will protect you, and I will keep you from the power of your enemies. Jacob could take these promises to the bank, and he was going to need them later on in this story. He's going to remind God of these promises that God gave as he left home. So notice that when he has to leave home because of his sin, his happy home because of his sin, God gives promises, and he says, you'll be coming back. I have not forsaken you. And of course, that ladder represents whom? Represents Christ. Through whom will all of these blessings be gained? Not the land of Canaan, but the earth. Through whom will we have an innumerable host of safe people that cannot be numbered, according to Revelation 7? Through whom will all of the human race be blessed when the curse is removed? There will be no more curse. And who will deliver his people from their enemies? It wasn't Jacob. It wasn't Abraham. It wasn't Isaac. It was a prophecy about what Jesus would do on a global, worldwide scale. And then, of course, Jacob leaves home. He has these promises when he leaves home that God says, I'm going to restore you someday. You're going to come back. And he ends up in Laban's house. There is no more satanic figure in the Bible than Laban. When you read the character of Laban, it's just like you're reading about the devil. Now let me mention a few things about Laban. He was a hypocrite. 
He feigned love, love for his daughters when Jacob left. He could care less about his daughters. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was an accuser. He was a thief. All characteristics that are mentioned in Scripture about the devil. In other words, Jacob ends up in the household of an individual who has a character just like the devil and makes the life of Jacob what? Miserable while he's away from home. In fact, notice Genesis 31 and verse 7. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. Notice the episode about his daughters. Genesis 31 verses 26 to 29. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? That you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and songs with timbrel and harp. Yeah, right. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. What a hypocrite. He was only concerned with appearances. Notice Genesis 31 verses 41 and 42. The dishonesty of this man. Self-serving. That made the life of Jacob difficult. By the way, was this experience in Laban's house useful to Jacob? Did he learn to be industrious? Did he learn to trust ever more in the Lord? He most certainly did. So it wasn't wasted time to live in the house of this conniving, self-serving individual. It was actually helpful for him to, to keenly sharpen his powers of discernment and his work ethic. Notice chapter 31 and verses 41 and 42. Thus I have been with your house twenty years. I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you have changed my wages 10 times. Every time, time he prospers, he says, now we've got to reduce your salary a little bit. Now this sounds familiar in our world today. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. And so Jacob spends 20 years in the house of this demonic figure. But at the end of the 20 years, Jacob decides that it's time to return to Canaan. And here's where this story becomes very interesting. Unless you come to our next lecture, you're only going to have half of the story. Because today we're just dealing with Jacob and Esau, their characters, how Jacob had to leave home, he ended up in the household of the enemy, and so on. We're just going to briefly touch upon the events that take place immediately before Jacob enters, re-enters the land of Canaan that he lost because of his sin. In Genesis chapter 32 and verse 6, we find the story of Esau still bent on destroying his brother because his brother had the birthright because his brother now was going to be the king and the priest and the progenitor of the Messiah now he's coming with 400 men with the intention of killing his brother and everybody with him. In Genesis 32 and verse 6 we find these words then the messengers returned to Jacob saying we came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. What do we call this? We call it the time of Jacob's trouble. When his brother who lived only with regard to this life, is now preparing to come and destroy his own brother. The one who has the birthright. The one who has the promises and the blessings of the covenant. He's now coming. And Jacob is now afraid and is distressed. He's afraid that God is not going to be able to protect him or to take care of him because of the grave sin that he had committed 20 years earlier. 
Had God already told him that his sin was forgiven? Had God told him that his sin was forgiven? Why did God even bother to give him the dream? God was saying, listen, you're forgiven. You're going to get the land back. You're going to have a large posterity. The blessing is going to come upon you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. Don't worry about it. Your enemies are not going to have ascendancy over you. But here we find Jacob afraid. He says, I'm afraid that my brother, along with these 400 men, is going to destroy me along with my family. And so Jacob now pours out his heart in prayer to the God who had spoken to him in the dream 20 years earlier. Notice Genesis 32 verses 9 through 12. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy. Do you notice what his attitude is? He feels his what? I want you to remember these details. He feels his total unworthiness. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. I have no right to pray to you. I'm a sinner. I have no right to claim your protection. It's only because I lay myself on your mercy that I even come and address you. Verse 11. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother. Not because I have any merit, but because of your mercy. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me, and the mother with the children. For you have said, I will surely treat you well, and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. What is Jacob claiming during this period of agony and struggle and prayer. He's claiming God's what? God's promises. In his unworthiness, he's claiming the promises of God. Remember that. You know, there's an interesting passage, if I can get ahead of myself a little bit, there's an interesting passage in Great Controversy. Actually, it's a whole chapter called The Time of Jacob's Trouble. And all the elements that we're looking at now, plus what we're going to study more fully in our next lecture, are found in that chapter of Great Controversy. In other words, what took place once with Jacob is going to take place at the end of time with God's remnant people as the wicked of the earth come to destroy God's people from the face of the earth. Now, as Jacob is pouring out his prayer to God in his unworthiness, by the way, the only way we can approach the throne of God is in our unworthiness. We can't make any demands on God. We're sinners. He's holy. It's only because of God's mercy and because God has promised that we can claim his promises. If God promises, we can claim them. Because God never gives a promise that he's not able or willing to fulfill. Now notice Genesis 32 as he's pouring out his soul to God asking for forgiveness for a sin that he committed 20 years earlier. And as he's asking God to protect him, we find that a man caught up to him, caught up to him and started wrestling with him. Notice Genesis 32, 24 to 26. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Quite a wrestling match. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him. That who didn't prevail against whom? That the man could not prevail against him. Because it continues saying, he touched the socket of his hip. Who touched the socket of his hip? The man that he was struggling with. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Do you think Jacob was in excruciating pain? Have you ever had a dislocated hip? Or a dislocated shoulder? You're talking about excruciating pain. It would have been very easy. By the way, at this point, does Jacob know that he's not struggling with a common, ordinary human being? Oh, yes he does. Just by touching him, dislocating his hip. He says there's something more than meets the eye here. And yet in spite of the fact that he's in excruciating pain, does Jacob let him loose? No. 
Notice chapter 32 and verse 26. The, the, this being says to him, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you what? Unless you bless me. Do you know that Jacob at this point had not been able to forgive himself? Do we need to learn a lesson about forgiveness, folks? You know, sometimes we commit a sin, and after we've committed the sin, we repent and we confess it to God, but in the course of time, we're never able to forgive ourselves. We always keep bringing it up and remembering it. I once had a parishioner. She came to me, she says, Pastor Boer, I have this sin. And I don't feel that God has forgiven me for it. I said, oh really? Uh, have you repented of it? Yes. Have you confessed it? Yes. I said, if you repented and confessed, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I said, so, so you're forgiven. She says, but pastor, I don't feel forgiven. And I said to her, listen, feelings have nothing to do with it. You don't believe that you're forgiven because you feel it, but because God says so. If God says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, you can take it to the bank, not because you feel it, but because God says it. We have to learn to live by what God says, not by our feelings. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so he says, let me go. And Jacob says, no way until I have the assurance that I'm forgiven and that you're going to be able to protect me and my family from the enemy who is coming. And now notice Genesis 32, 27 and 28. So he said to him, what is your name? He says to Jacob, by the way, the name Jacob means supplanter. <laughs> Do you know Jacob was actually trying to supplant his brother from the moment that he was in the womb? It says that he grabbed his brother by the heel because he was trying to pull Esau down so he, he could be born first. And then of course he supplanted his brother by taking his birthright. But had the character of Jacob changed? Yes it had. He was a repentant man claiming the promises of God, humbled by his experience, having learned for 20 years in the household of the enemy. And so it says in chapter 32 and verses, verse 28, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. The name Israel means prince of God. For you have struggled with God and with men and have what? And have prevailed. You have struggled with men and with whom? God. Who was that man that Jacob was struggling with? That man was nothing less than Michael the archangel. You say, how do you know that? Go with me to the book of Hosea chapter 12 and verses 3 and 4. There it comes through very clearly. Genesis says it was a man. Hosea explains who this man was. It says there in Hosea 12 verses 3 and 4, speaking about Jacob, he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. He struggled with whom? With God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. Favor from whom? From the angel. Did you catch that or not? It says he struggled with God. Then it says that he struggled with the what? With the angel and he wept and sought favor from him. That is from the angel. Who is this angel? This angel is Jesus. By the way, as we'll notice in our next lecture, in Daniel chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar sees four men in the furnace, he says, I see four men, and the fourth man looks like the Son of God. But a little bit later on, Nebuchadnezzar said that God sent his angel to deliver his servants. So who is the angel? The angel is the Son of God. 
This is Michael the Archangel Christ in its pre-incarnate state. Who was Jacob wrestling with? He was wrestling with Jesus. By the way, is this story going to be repeated again? Allow me to go now through this story very quickly to see how it is going to be reenacted in the end time with God's people. Are there going to be two groups in the world at the end of time that manifest the characteristics of Jacob and Esau? Absolutely. Is the final war going to be brother against brother, spiritually speaking? Is the weaker going to have ascendancy eventually over the stronger? Absolutely. You can notice for example Revelation 3 and verse 9 where it says that the synagogue of Satan which are the powers of the world that have ascendancy will come and they will worship before the feet of those whom God has loved. Has God promised those of his followers that they will be kings and priests? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 says that Jesus has made us kings and priests. Are we the firstborn then? Absolutely. Do we have the privilege someday of living with the Messiah? Absolutely. So the birthright that belonged to Jacob actually is our birthright in Christ. The right someday of being kings and priests and dwelling with the Messiah who gave us that birthright. Will those who have the character of Esau in the end time despise God's holy law? Will they consider that the law of God is a yoke of bondage? Will they live in this world as if there is no other world for the pl present pleasures of life and sell their eternal birthright as kings and priests? The privilege of living with the Messiah forever, sell it, so to speak, for a plate of lentils for temporary, momentary pleasures, things in this life? Absolutely. By the way, did we lose our home as a result of our sin? What was our home? Eden. Did God promise Adam and Eve the very day that they sinned that Eden would be recovered? Did He give them a messianic prophecy? Prophecy? Absolutely. Genesis 3.15. He says, I'm going to send a seed to the world and He's going to do battle with the serpent and He's going to crush the serpent's head. And you are going to be restored. So God's people received a messianic prophecy. A glimmer of hope just like Jacob did when he had to flee his home. Where did we end up when we left our Eden home? In whose house? In Laban's house, so to speak. What kind of a being is Satan? Is he like Laban? He most certainly is. Is he a conniver? Is he a deceiver? Is he a liar? He has all of those traits. It is he self-serving. Will he make you look, make it look like he's doing things for your good and someone else's good when he's really doing it for himself? He's just like Laban. Will he want to keep us serving him forever? To serve his own purposes. Yes, in other words, we ended up in Laban's house. Is it a blessing to be in Laban's house? In a certain sense? What does God want us to do while we're in Laban's house? Work hard. Occupy until I come, Jesus said. And keep our eyes open to the possibility of deception. And not allow Laban, so to speak, to gain the ascendancy over us. And have the assurance that God is going to bless us and He's going to keep us like He did Jacob. Even in the midst of being in Laban's conniving household. Are God's people going to go through a severe time of trouble shortly before we return to our home which we lost? Absolutely. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's mentioned in Daniel 12 verse 1. We're going to study about this time of trouble. It's an amazing story. Very profoundly biblical. If you wonder where Ellen White is getting her information from when she has that chapter in Great Controversy, you've got to come to the next lecture. 
Because we're going to study this in detail. The fulfillment is found in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44, where the powers of the earth go out, bent on destroying God's people at the end of time. And then it says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. That's the angel. Michael shall stand up. That prince which stand wa stands watch over the children of your people. And there will be such a time of trouble such as never has been seen. But at that time, your people will be what? Delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. This story, once again, is going to be repeated. What are God's people going to claim during this time of severe trouble? Will they, will they in humility say to God, we depend on your mercy, we depend on your promises? Absolutely, it will be the only thing that will sustain God's people as the powers of the earth come with the intention of destroying God's people. And by the way, do you know that uh, God's people will struggle in the time of trouble, struggle with Jesus spiritually in prayer because at the end we're dealing with worldwide spiritual events that little microcosm back there that little model in miniature story really illustrates worldwide global events and spiritual issues it's no longer literal Israel and literal Esau it is spiritual Israel and people who have the character of Esau and by the way when God's people eventually prevail do you know that Revelation 3 verse 12 says that they will receive a new name? Those who overcome will receive a what? A new name. And then let me ask you, will God's people once again return to the land which God promised? Absolutely. The meek will inherit the earth. Will God's people be in a land where there is no longer any curse? Revelation 22 verse 3 says the curse is gone. All is blessing. Was that one of the promises that God made? To Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob? Yes. Will God's people have been delivered from their enemies and now be safe in the kingdom? Absolutely. And will God's people be in the midst of a multitude which no man can number? According to Revelation chapter 7. Yes. All of these promises claimed during the time, time of trouble by God's people will be eventually fulfilled on a global, worldwide scale with God's people. Now before we bring this to a close, I need to ask the question, are we living for this present age? Are we living for the here and now rather than looking to the sweet by and by the houses we buy the automobiles we drive the money we keep stored in the bank while the work of God languishes the luxurious clothing that we wear the expensive toys that we buy is this perhaps telling us that maybe we're looking to the here and now rather than to the sweet by and by? Notice what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18. Are we selling our heavenly birthright for temporal present pleasures? Could it happen to me? It certainly could. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, see our affliction now is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, our present affliction is light, it's small, compared to the glory that's going to come. While, no, notice this, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. What do we look at? Not what's seen, but what's not seen. For the things which are seen, that's our houses, our cars, our money, our clothes, uh, our toys, whatever it is, it says, for the things which are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. 
One final story we find in Hebrews 11, the story of Moses. You know, Moses was in line to be the next Pharaoh of Egypt. And God said to him, I want you to go to the desert with the rebellious people who are always going to be criticizing you. There's going to be heat, there's going to be snakes, you know. Uh, they're going to want to stone you all of the time. I, instead of becoming the next Pharaoh of Egypt, I want you to have all of the wealth and all of the fame and all of the power. I want you to choose to go out into the desert with this, with this people. What would you have chosen? Good question. Better bird in hand than two in the bush. That's the philosophy of many. But it says in Hebrews chapter 11 that Moses preferred affliction with the people of God than having the temporary and momentary pleasures of sin. In fact, he was sustained, it says in Hebrews 11, by seeing him who is invisible. Invisible means you can't see it, but he was sustained seeing him who is invisible. May that be our experience as well.